God will always bless an individual that is a soul in an individual. Uh, and if you will get that focus back in your heart and your mind, uh, and I believe many of you used to have that, uh, but it is, it is kind of blurred, it is kind of faded. Um, there used to be a time when souls were what we thought about on a daily basis, who we would come in contact with that may be lost and who we may come across this particular day that God may give us an opportunity to witness. But unfortunately, we spend a lot more time now talking about things like sports and society and school and so forth. And we know those things are a part of life, but they should be our primary focus. Amen? Souls and the Savior should be our primary focus. So our theme for this year, and it just so happens it lands right here where we're at in Proverbs in our Wednesday night series, is let's get serious about souls. So if you would stand to your feet at this time. We're going to begin in verse 11 and look down through verse 12 tonight. The Bible says, If thou forbear, in other words, to hold back, to deliver them that are drawn unto death. And by the way, the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Yeah. We know there's a whole world of people out there that are lost without Christ that are dead in their trespasses and sin. And if they die like that, they will go to hell for all of eternity. And it said, And those that are ready to be slain, If thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it, in other words, you can't fool God. Say amen. And, and right about there be a good place. Amen. And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And he shall not, and excuse me, and shall not he render to every man according to his what? Words. Words. Be seated. As I said before, the American Christian seems to be very focused and uh, very much in tune with a lot of different things in society that they consider to be important. For example, sports. I bet there's been a lot of people that have talked a whole lot more uh, about the college national championship game that's coming up Monday night uh, than they have actually talked about the Savior or talked about souls. We know schools start back up tomorrow, and I bet there's a lot of people that have talked more about school than they have about souls and about the Savior. Uh, we talk about health. This time of year is when everybody makes that commitment that you know good well you're not going to keep. And that is that you're going to be healthier in 2019. You're going to eat better. You're going to lose that weight or whatever it may be. And then at the end of the year, you know you failed miserably at that. Say amen tonight. Amen. And, and, and they talk about politics. We've got the, uh, <clears throat> the whole thing right now dealing with the uh, uh, budget and the government shutdown. And people are talking a lot about politics and the things that are involved with that. Uh, people are talking about the economy, jobs, family, money, cars, entertainment, clothes, Christmas presents, and still yet they're eerily silent on the subject of souls. But do you understand tonight that that does not change the destiny of the lost one bit? Hell is still hot. People are still lost. They're still dying, and they're going there by the thousands every day. And tonight we need to get back to where souls are a focal point in our life. There is not a person in this room tonight that does not have a mission field. I don't care if you're a stay-at-home mom or if you're a doctor or a lawyer or a coal miner or whatever you may be. The fact is, is everybody here has a mission field. If you're retired, you still got a mission field. You can't tell me that in a seven-day week that you don't come in contact with people that you might not normally come in contact with or people that you also know for a fact are lost. How many of y'all would say, Preacher, I come in contact with people like that all the time. Raise your hand up. All over this room, you've got a mission field. And we need to readjust our focus and get back to where souls are the most important thing. Jesus looked out upon all those multitudes that were there, and He said, The harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. And we know that's the case today. There are people that could make an impact on souls that are not because they're not focused on them. So we need to get real serious about souls in 2019. I don't care who you are, what your intelligence level is, what your calling is, what you do for a living, everybody's got a mission field. So we're going to look at a few things here in this passage that will help us to get serious about souls again. Number one, notice this in verse 11. There is a startling reality in verse 11. The Bible says, if thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto what? Yes. Death. Circle that word death. And those that are ready to be what? Slain. Circle that word slain there. 
Now, it is estimated that 125,000 people will die between now and tomorrow this time. 125,000 people will leave this world. And it is estimated that the large portion or number of them, upwards of 90 plus percent, will die lost and go to hell without Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That ought to sober us up tonight. Amen? And, and even more startling than that is this. Between right now and tomorrow this time, 138,000 people will be birthed into this world. So we are losing ground big time. 125,000 check out, 138,000 check in. That means our population is growing exponentially and still yet the large majority of those people are lost and dying and going to hell. I said all that to say this. If, hypothetically, we can stop all of the deaths and all of the births right now, and not there not be another death or another birth on this earth, do you know how long at the current rate that we go out soul winning and witnessing as a group of Christians around the world, do you know how long it would take us to re reach the world's current population? Four thousand years. It would take four thousand years at the pace we're going as Christians, as soul winners, to reach the people that are on this planet right now. And you know what? That is an impossibility. But if we were to get God's people to do what God told them to do, then we could cover a whole lot of ground, not just here in Lee County, Virginia, but around this world. The problem is we do not do what we're supposed to do. There was a, uh, a particular man, um, he had committed a murder, he was convicted of that, he was sentenced to death, and he was on death row. Right before he was uh, to die, about the week before he was supposed to die uh, on uh, and, and be executed, the governor pardoned this man. And he gave the pardon to one of the workers that was there in the prison. And this particular worker, unbeknownst to the governor, hated this particular prisoner. And so instead of taking the pardon to the man, he threw it in the garbage. And the man was executed even though he had a pardon that was available to him. You say, preacher, that is a terrible and a vile and a horrible and a mean thing to do. Well, let me tell you something worse than that. We've got Christians all over this world that know how to tell people to be pardoned from their sin and to go to heaven and to stay out of hell and they walk by them every day and never hand them a track or never invite them to church or never even open their mouths and tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you tell me which one of the two is worse. Somebody that didn't hand a man a pardon that would have kept him from dying physically or multiplied thousands of Christians who know how to keep people out of hell but won't tell them about the pardon that will keep them alive for, for the rest of their life. So there's a startling reality. We are not doing what we ought to be doing as Christians. Number two, there is a shallow reply. Look at it, verse 12. It says, if thou sayest, behold, we knew it not. You know what I would say right there? Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> you are in a Bible-believing church tonight, and you have been for quite some time. There is not a soul in this building tonight that does not know that people are dying and going to hell. How many of y'all came in here tonight and you're shocked to know that people are dying and going to hell? Anybody that is just plain shocked? How many of y'all came in here tonight and you can say, Preacher, I knew people were dying and going to hell when I walked in this building tonight. Raise your hand up. You can't say you don't know this. You do know this. You've been under my ministry for a long time. And, 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 and the fact is, is that you know that people are lost. And they're all around you every day and they're dying and going to hell. So what a shallow thing to say, I didn't know. You know, you can't say you don't know. Because you do know. You know what's going on out there. You know that people are lost and dying. You know that there are sinners all around you. How many of you can think of somebody that is a friend or a family member? Uh, and when I say friend, I'm talking about an associate maybe on your job or, or wherever. Or a friend in your neighborhood or in your school or wherever, college, wherever it may be. 
or a family member that you think or maybe you know is lost tonight? Raise your hand up. Now, hold it up high. Do not put your hand up. Look around. Everybody just look around real quick. Look at what I'm looking at. You see how serious this thing is now? That, and, and there's over 100 people in this room tonight, I know. And if we were to add just one lost person to each one of you, that means that there's over 100 people that are dying and going to hell right now that you know about. And if you go through till next week, and you go in and out of gas stations and in and out of uh, restaurants and, and uh, in and out of schools and things like that, you're going to go around more people that are like that. I bet you every one of us can name three people, probably three that we know of that are lost. And so to say we don't know, that would be a very shallow reply. Then number three, there is a serious reckoning. Look out of verse 12 now. Now, you've got to understand tonight that I'm not trying to make your happy new year not happy new year. Okay? Because I believe we can fix this tonight. And I'm going to tell you how. Okay? So, so don't hang your head down and say, oh, preacher came back from North Carolina and he's busting at me tonight. <laughs> No, I'm trying to help you tonight because I'm going to tell you something. God will bless our church if we get a hold of this tonight. There's a serious reckoning. Look down at verse 12. If thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not. Look at the next part now. Doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth uh, thy soul. So obviously he's talking about saved people, correct? Because it, 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 the Lord keeps your soul. Am I right? Okay. He's the keeper of our soul. Doth not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? Now, here's the thing. He's talking about saved people. There's going to be a reckoning to the people of God for what they did not do. For the fact that they did not do what that they were supposed to be doing. Does that mean we lose our salvation? No. Does that mean we're going to be punished uh, when we get to heaven? No. So what is this talking about? Well, number one, uh, there is going to be a loss of rewards. A loss of rewards. Look over with me real quick. If you would, in 1 Corinthians 3. And then we're going to turn to one more place. I have you turned to a couple places tonight, actually. 1 Corinthians 3. <clears throat> There'll be a loss of rewards. <coughs> you say, big deal. Oh, it will be. Trust me. See, a lot of people think because they're saved, they're going to heaven, that it doesn't matter what else they do, you know, it's okay. If I don't, if I don't you know, fit the bill or whatever, you know, God's going to wink at me and pat me on the back and say welcome home and all that kind of stuff. And you know what? You are going to go to heaven if you're saved. But the fact is you also are going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And if you think that that's going to be a comfortable experience, you are wrong. Now watch this, 1 Corinthians 3 in verse 13. Now, remember, while you got that, let me read this last part here. He shall render every man according to his works. And this deals with soul winning now. So listen to this. Verse 13, every man's what? Work. Work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it. That day is the judgment seat of Christ. That's for the saved people, not the lost people. Because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And it's not hell fire. This is not a fire that burns your soul. It's a fire that sorts out the works that you did or did not do for the Lord. Verse 14, if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a what? Reward. Reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. In other words, he'll lose the rewards. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now, go over to 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. Take a right. 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. One more verse here. And then I'm going to break this down into three categories of lost rewards or gained rewards. <coughs> 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. Notice it says, for we, and he's talking to saved people at the church at Corinth, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of what? Now don't confuse this with the great white throne judgment, which is for the lost people. This is for the saved people. Okay? That everyone may receive the things done in his what? So that means what you've done on this earth for the Lord. According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now that bad is, all we automatically think sin. That has nothing to do with sin. We're talking about the things that you did for the Lord. 
And the good or the bad is this. It deals with your method and your motivation. Okay? It has nothing to do with sin whatsoever. Your sin, if you're saved tonight, was taken care of on Calvary over 2,000 years ago. And the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from A-L-L all sin. That means your past sin. That means your present sin. And that means your prospective sin that you may commit in the future. By the way, all of your sins were future when Christ died on the cross at Calvary. So your sin is covered. Now in this life, you will be judged for your sin that you do in your body, not in your soul though. Okay? So the Bible says, Whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom He receiveth. So if you sin here, shake your fist in the face of God and say, I'm going to do this, that, and the other, and, and you're saved, God will treat you like you would your own child. He'll take you to the woodshed and wear you out. How many of y'all have been wore out by God before? Yeah. How many of you just love that and want to do it again? <laughs> not me either. Been there and done that. Not again. Okay? So, thank God if you keep short accounts with the Lord, though, you don't have to worry about that. If your child does something wrong and he immediately comes up with a humble heart and says, I'm sorry, I should not have done that, you're very forgiven towards them. If he keeps on doing it over and over again, you're going to tear up that honey in, ain't you? Right? Uh, and if, you're, if they're old as my youngins, then you're going to find them and pad your own bank account. <laughs> Amen. Teach them what it's like to lose rewards, right? Amen. All right. Somebody like, wait, we can do that? Yes, you can. All right. All right. Now, let me divide this lost rewards up into three things. Uh, number one, there are laid up rewards. Those are the, the things you get. So if you witness to somebody, now let me explain something. You can't win everybody. You're not going to win everybody. So you might as well go ahead and get over that. Uh, if you base your soul winning on who you win, you'll quit. I promise you. It's not that. You can't win everybody, but you can witness to everybody. And that's what it's about. It's about presenting the gospel to them. And do you know that every time you tell somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ, that you are laying up rewards in heaven? Did you know that? Did you know that every time you hand a gospel tract to somebody, you're laying up rewards in heaven? God came and set our internet stuff up today. Got a chance to talk to him and handed him a gospel tract today. Did I win him to the Lord? No. But I will tell you this. I laid up rewards because I gave him that gospel tract. Okay? I gave him the gospel plan of salvation. So you're going to lay up rewards for soul winning. But then number two, there are rewards that are not only laid up, that will be, but also those that are left behind. In other words, you'll have to leave them behind at the judgment seat and watch them be burned up. Why? Because as I said before, you have the wrong method. Okay? There's churches today that uh, mean good but are doing things the wrong way. Uh, they're doing things the contemporary way, the new modern way, and all those kinds of things. The Bible says, seek ye out the old paths, for in them is, is the way of life. And so the old paths, you're to do things the old-fashioned way. And if you have a rock concert just to get people in to try to tell them about the gospel, you are losing rewards for that. Okay? You're not doing it the right way. It's the wrong method or the wrong motive. If you hand out tracts and witness so you can get glory for it, and you brag about how much soul winning and witnessing you've done, then you're not going to get rewards for that. So that is the wrong motive and the wrong method. Okay? So you're going to lose rewards. There'll be those that are left behind. Then there's those that are of lost opportunities. And I believe with all my heart, based on Scripture, that when you get to heaven and you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, your life as a saved individual, from the time you got saved, is going to be played before your eyes. And you're going to see not only what you did and what you uh, uh, did the wrong way, but you're also going to see what you could have done. The opportunities you passed up and the rewards you could have had. And what a sad and sobering thing to have to give an account for that. You see, we sing that song, there's no more tears in heaven, but there's two times there are tears in heaven. One is here at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, Revelation 7, 17. The Lord wipes away tears after the judgment seat. And then the second time deals with what we're about to talk about, and that is the last sentencing. So we see lost rewards, but we see a last sentencing. There's going to be tears here, and it's going to be a very sobering thing as well. Go with me over to Revelation 20. I think perhaps the saddest verses in the Word of God. The most sobering verses. If, it, if you want to see... A motivating passage for soul winning. This is it. Now we will be here at this judgment, but we will not be judged 
Our judgment is the judgment seat of Christ for the saved. This deals strictly with the lost. And you're going to see every lost soul that's ever been throughout eternity, including the ones that you've been around that died without Christ. And we will see this here. The Bible says in Revelation 20 and 11, And I saw a great white throne in Him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. By the way, if you're saved tonight, your name is in the book of life. Amen. The Bible says, Rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto thee, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And we ought to be excited tonight if we're saved because our names are permanently recorded in the Lamb's book of life. And thank God for it. And the Bible says, And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. In other words, it's going to be like a law, a courthouse, if you would. And you've got a prosecuting attorney, uh, and you've got the judge, and you've got yourself as your own personal defense attorney. And they're going to go through and they're going to try to find your name in the Lamb's Book of Life and it won't be there if you're lost. And you're going to say, but I did this and but I did that, but I did this, but it won't matter. Because what matters is what you did with Jesus, not what you did. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so you're going to be judged and your name will not, if you're lost, your name will not be found in the Book of Life. But if you're saved, it will be. And of course, that will already have been determined. This is more of confirmation that you've never been saved. Not confirmation that you uh, are saved. And then it says in verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. That's all those that were dead in the past that were lost and burning in hell, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And you know what? We're going to be there to see that. And it's going to be an awful thing. And if you did not witness to somebody and you could have, you'll give an account. You'll see that. You'll give an account at the judgment seat of Christ, but you're going to see that individual at the great white throne. Now, you've got to understand that those people died rejecting Christ of their own free will. But the fact is, is that you will have to see those that you did not witness to. What if you would have witnessed to them? And that just that one more witness, that one more opportunity may have been the one that got them to Christ. And you know that. You say, are we going to have to live with that kind of a thought for all of eternity? No. But you will live with it there. But thank God after that, look at Revelation 21 and 4. The Bible says that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Now watch this. For the former things are passed away. God's going to wipe your mind at that point. When this is over with, your mind is wiped of all that stuff. And the only thing you have knowledge of is the Lord and heaven and peace and the wonderful things that we have because we're saved. But the fact that you're going to see these people cast in the lake of fire ought to motivate you to share the gospel. Because I believe this. If they die lost and you share the gospel with them, your conscience is going to be clear whenever they're cast in the lake of fire. But if you know you could have won them to Christ, your conscience will not be clear and God will have to wipe that out eventually. I would rather be there with a clear conscience. Would you? Amen. Amen. So there'll be lost rewards and there'll be a last sentencing. Now, here's some simple rules. We've seen now the startling reality, a shallow reply, a serious reckoning, but now there's some simple rules that can change all of this radically for you and I. Rules that we can apply as a Christian and as a church. Write these down. Number one, we can admit our problem. In other words, you can confess to the Lord, Lord, I have not been doing what I should have been doing as a soul winner. You can tell Him, and thank God, the Bible says that if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you can admit that to the Lord. You can tell Him, I have not been winning souls the way that I should have been. <laughs> Number two, you can agonize in prayer. You can agonize in prayer. Admit your problem, but you can agonize in prayer. Several things you need to be praying about. Number one, Lord, help me to be a soul winner. Make me a soul winner. Help me to have the courage and the opportunities to win people to Christ. It wouldn't hurt us one bit to pray every morning when we get up. God, give me an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody today. 
whether it's on the phone, Facebook, in person, or whatever. And I understand, I, I understand completely uh, people uh, that are teachers in this room. I know you can't go into your classroom and use your English class or your science class or your math class or whatever class as a pulpit. I get that, and I understand that. But that does not mean that you might not have to open the door somewhere along the way. Maybe God opens the mouth of a student to ask a question about the Lord or something, and you can use that as an opportunity. When they bring it up, you have it, it's fair game at that point. And so maybe you ought to pray that the Lord will give you an opportunity. The bus drivers, uh, you can't get on there and use that as a pulpit, but if they bring it up, you can say something. Okay? Those on your job. Uh, open doors can be anywhere at any time. It could be in a restaurant. It could be in a gas station. But we need to be agonizing in prayer uh, that God will help us to be a soul winner and open those doors for us. Give us the courage to be able to share the gospel. Now, uh, let me say this real quick. We also should make a list of people that we personally know that are lost. And we ought to pray over these people. Take one day of prayer. Uh, you can pick a day of the week and pray over these names. Make a list of them. You may have five names. You may have 25 names. Make a list and pick one day to pray over them. And pray that God will deal with them, send a soul winner to them, give you an opportunity or whatever it may be. Friends, family members, students, whatever you may, whoever it is, uh, be praying over them. Let me tell you an interesting story. I know of a pastor's wife. Uh, they pastored up in Alaska. And uh, this pastor's wife... Uh, uh, began to listen to some of the ladies that were in the church. They talked often about their husband, a rough area, uh, about their husbands that were lost, the brothers that were lost, the dads that were lost. And uh, she got with these, she, she got these ladies together and said, listen, let's make a list of the names of these men that are lost, these people that you have a burden for. And they came up with a list of 34 names. So every Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, they met, they had coffee, they had a little devotion, and they prayed over this list beginning in January of a particular year. At the end of that year, by December, 31 of the 34 people on that list have been saved. Amen. That's the power of prayer. And I'll tell you this, I have recognized in our church in times past, when we got a burden for souls and people began to pray for folks to get saved in the services and saved through our ministries, whether it's the clothing closet, or revival meetings, or the drama, or whatever it may be, that we saw people get saved. I remember back in 2004, we had a great revival in the old church, and we met over in the fellowship hall and prayed, and people wept to where we literally, I'm not saying figuratively, I mean literally, had to mop the tears up off the floor in the fellowship hall. Where we go and have our fellowship dinners. And multitudes of people got saved. Here uh, in 2013, when all those, when 33 people got saved, I remember the prayer meetings like they, it was yesterday that we had in these homes that were hosted by these homes. People wept and they cried and they begged God to save their family members. And we prayed a specific prayer that God would save uh, one of the meanest people in Lee County. We didn't even know what the name of the person was. We just prayed that and God did it. And at the end of that week, 33 people have been saved. So when you start praying for souls, souls start getting saved. Right. And we need to be, be praying. So we need to agonize in prayer. And then number three, we need to approach the people. How do you do that? Two ways. Number one, you need to invite people to church. Invite people to church. Now let me give you something that will blow your mind. And I did the math on my handy dandy calculator on my phone while I go to make sure, because I'm not the math whiz in the family, and uh, the math whiz was over here at the church practicing music. So I, I did this with my calculator, so I know it's right, okay? And I was assuming when I did this there'd be over 100 people in the room, and there is tonight. If everybody in this room, now listen carefully, if everybody in this room, and there's over 100 here, so we'll just say we'll round it at 100, make it simple. If everybody in this room invited one person a week to church, and I'm talking about one different person a week, at the end of the year, you would have extended 5,200 invitations to this church. If 100 people invited a different one, just one, not three, but one different person every week, for 52 weeks, there would be 5,200 different people that would be invited to this church. And if just 1% of 
of those people came to this church and got saved, we would have baptized 52 different people by the end of this year. Let that soak in. Now, now let me ask you a question. Do you come across enough people in a year that you can invite at least one different person every week? Not 10, not 12, but one. Extend an invitation to one different person a week for 52 weeks. How many of y'all believe that we have that opportunity? Raise your hand up. Okay? We just need to take advantage of it. Just one. Just one. Just say, God, give me one person I can invite to church this week that's different. And then next week, a different person. Next, at the end of 52 weeks, because this is as far as I know, January the 2nd, right? Okay, so we got 52 weeks. We could, we could do it at least this week, starting this week by Sunday, and then by the end of the year, we would have extended 5,200 invitations to 5,200 different people. And if 1% got saved, that's 52. What a phenomenal thought, right? See how, how easy we can correct this? And then number two, not only do we need to invite the people or, uh, to church, but we also need to introduce the people to Christ. When we're given an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus, we need to take advantage of it. Quit being scared and backing down and thinking, I'm going to blow this. The only way you blow it is if you don't say anything. Right? You cannot fail if you try to share the gospel. And the easiest way to do it is just tell people what you did to get saved. And it's easy. You accepted Christ. How many of y'all remember the day you got saved? Amen. How many of y'all think you could tell somebody about the day you got saved? All right? And if, if you got saved in here, everybody got saved the same way. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For by grace are you saved through faith. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you need to be telling them. When, and I'm not saying everybody, you, you, you can't tell everybody all of the time. But when there's doors that are open, you need to go through them. Amen? And again, I want to reiterate this fact. You cannot win all of the people that you witness to. You just can't do it because not all the people want to be saved. But you can witness to all of them. And if you do that, your hands are clean. Your hands are clean. It says if you fail to warn them, but if you do warn them, your hands are clean. You can stand before God one day with a clear conscience knowing you did exactly what you were supposed to be doing. This year, I want to be a year of growth through souls getting saved. I want us to get a burden for the lost again. Lost friends, lost family members, lost folks in our community, on our jobs. And let's get them to Christ. Let's do everything we can through the dramas, the marriage conferences, the youth rallies. Um, we do a lot of neat stuff here at this church that can draw people out. And we can, we can use these opportunities. We're going to have a tent meeting uh, for the, the uh, homeless and needy here in Lee County, Virginia uh, coming up in the spring. We expect to draw probably 500 people to that minimum. And we're going to set that tent up out here in the uh, field. And we're going to have clothes and all that stuff that we did over in Abingdon. Uh, those of you that went with us over there, we're going to have that in the spring. We've got so many wonderful opportunities, camps, uh, all these different things. We just need to take advantage of it. We need to get excited about seeing people saved again. Let's stand to our feet tonight. Let's come down to the altar. Spend a little time praying for some of these folks that we have on our heart tonight. <laughs> Praying that God will help us to be the soul winners that we should be, to, to have these opportunities, to take advantage of these opportunities that God has given us, to have more opportunities. Those that we come in contact with, those that we see out on the street, those that we go by every day, that God would give us these opportunities to share the gospel. Father, bless the invitation tonight. There will be one lost person here tonight. I pray, God, that they, as they've heard, Lord, the truths about soul winning, they will respond to the call of salvation tonight, that they would simply come and receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. Simple childlike faith, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God, help us to see a multitude of people saved this year. Help us to do our part. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Hello, my name is Charles Barrier, pastor of Calvary Baptist Church here in Pennington Gap, Virginia. Thank you for joining us today. I hope the message that you just heard was both inspiring and a help to you in many ways. I want to take just a moment before we depart to ask you a very important question. And the question is this, are you 100% sure that you're saved, that you're going to heaven when you die? 
If you're not, that is a very important question that you need to answer. Because the Bible says in Hebrews 9 and 27, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. If you don't know 100% for sure that you're saved, the good news is the Bible says you can be. In 1 John 5 and 13, the Bible says this, These things have I written unto you, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. You say, how do I know that I've got eternal life? Well, you've got to come to this agreement that you're a sinner. The Bible says in Romans 3 and 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says also that there's a sentence for your sin. In Romans 6 and 23, it says the wages of sin is death. Now, there are two types of death in the Bible. There's an earthly death, but there's also something far worse, and that is an eternal death. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14 that the Bible says this, Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. This is a death that is perpetual and goes on throughout all eternity. It's a death where you don't burn up, but where you burn as a payment for your own sins. But here's the good news. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said this, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now, if you know that you're a sinner and you know that you need to be saved and you're not 100% for sure that you're going to heaven, the Bible says this, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Do you believe that he was buried and that he arose again on the third day? If you do, then you believe the gospel. That is the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the next step is this. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you ready to take that step right now? Are you ready to turn from your sin and turn to the Savior and ask Jesus Christ to save you? If you are, then right now where you're at would be a great time to do that. Now, if you don't know what to pray, I would like to help you with that. Because it's not a magical prayer that saves you, but many people are oftentimes uncomfortable with praying a particular prayer or just not knowing how to pray. So maybe you would like to pray something like this with me from the very bottom of your heart. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. Jesus, Will you please forgive me for my sins, wash me in your blood, and save my soul from hell, and be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name. Now, if you did pray just right then and there and ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, and you meant it from the very bottom of your heart, we would love to help you in your new walk with the Lord. We would like for you to call the number that is on the screen and leave us a message and let us know that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Leave us an address, a phone number, so that we could contact you. We would like to send you a Bible and some materials to help you in your walk with Christ. And we would like to rejoice with you. And we thank you for joining us today. Goodbye.